Hey, this is Andy Jenkins, and welcome back to the podcast. This week, I want to pick up where I left off really two episodes ago. Now, I I took this brief interlude to insert in the Coaches series. Uh, That's something I'm going to continue doing because the truth is, there are experts all around us. In fact, you may be one. If you are, reach out to me and I'll feature you here on the podcast and we'll talk about the area of your expertise where you have this unique skill set, this wheelhouse to help other people move forward in some specific area of life, whether that is, uh, we've discussed really so far, faith and we've talked about really your field, your career, what it is you do full time, uh, whether that's something you get paid for or not. Uh, There are so many other areas, fitness and finance and family, friends, fun. Um, And I don't have to have just one in each of those areas. And so if if you're an expert, reach out to me. This week and for two more weeks, I want to shift back in to soul wholeness and I want to feature uh, again, another chapter from the audiobook of Soul Wholeness. Now, as I told you two weeks ago, I have a book that's come out, paperback book. Uh, I would love for you to grab a hold of that. It's in the show notes below. I have an audiobook. It's not yet released. It will be soon. It'll be available on Audible, and I'll even show you how I can get that book absolutely free, uh, the audio version. And there's a 14 video course. I put all of the links here below in the show notes where you can learn more about all of that. Uh, And there's also a free PTSD self-check that's gonna help you assess where you are emotionally. Let's face it, life is beautiful, life is also hard, and if you walk out in the rain, you're gonna get wet. If you walk through life, at some point you're gonna get hurt. Uh, That's not doom and gloom, that's just reality. We deal with it, we're not victims. Uh, Well, sometimes (laughs) we're the victim, we just don't stay in that mentality. We get healing, we forgive, we release, and we move on. And so I want to talk today and for the next two episodes about three different types of soul wounds that we tend to get stuck into. Now, you may be affected by one, you might be affected by all three, and I'm not saying that this is the end all of soul junk and clutter and baggage. I'm just saying there are three big areas that I see. One is dealing with the hurts of the past, and sometimes you get triggered, or on the extreme end, that might actually be post-traumatic stress, or if it's diagnosed, post-traumatic stress disorder. It is when you've got baggage and clutter from the past and continue reinterpreting things in the present in light of the hurts and wounds of the past. That's what we're going to talk about today. And I'm going to share with you a chapter uh, from the Soul Wholeness book. This one comes from chapter 10, where I really talk about the belief expectation flywheel and how soul memory is often a lot of times like muscle memory. You, you might have muscle memory that enables you to, to type on the keyboard without looking at the keys or to, to ride a bike. And, and when you drive, you're exercising soul memory all the time when you're shifting gears, you're not even thinking about it. Soul memory works in very much the same way. And I'll share with you some insight here that I learned from one of my friends from the essential oil world, Dr. Benjamin Perkis. Uh, next week, I wanna talk to you about wound type number two, which is really soul ties. Soul ties are when our heart becomes connected to the wrong things or our heart becomes connected to the right things but in the wrong way. Now, that one's tricky because sometimes even good things can take a bad hold on us in a a tricky way. You You think about, here's the extreme example, you think about work and workaholics. The work is something that was given to us before the fall. Work is beautiful, but goodness, we can step into hustle really quickly and hustle can become toil and we can start chasing our identity in external things or we can start shoring up an internal deficiency through some type of addiction. So in next week, we're gonna, we're gonna talk about soul ties and then after that, we're gonna go into this idea of what I call guilt and shame. Uh, I mean, that's common. Uh, Guilt and shame. There's going to be this word I I learned from my time on staff at a nonprofit in town from Crosswinds that moral injury, 
Now that's a wide term. They didn't use it. They, they just put incredible articulation and incredible definition uh, to that through some of their films and through some of the books that they have, some of the resources they have for veterans. Uh, but you don't have to be a veteran to experience guilt and shame and moral injury. And so we'll talk about that in week three. Okay, here's the audio where I talk about the belief expectation flywheel in the book, Soul Wholeness. After the audio, I'll be back. Chapter 10, Self-Protective Self. Main idea, we're designed to grow by exploring the world around us, but we bump into painful experiences as we do. So we create often unconscious rules to protect ourselves from future pain. Some of the rules are functional and help us. Others are dysfunctional and hinder us. In January 2019, I wrote the first draft of Emotional Wholeness Checklist, a book about feelings and the importance of recognizing them in ourselves. The premise is this. All of our feelings, both the ones we typically consider to be good and those we often consider to be bad, are important. Emotions are to our souls the same thing physical sensations are to our bodies. You read the latest update of that material in part one of this book. So think back to some of the concepts we learned as they relate to that final sentence, emotions being to our souls what physical sensations are to our bodies. When we feel physical pain, we understand that something is wrong. We could be sick, we might be tired, or we might be in danger. The bad sensation highlights that something is off. When we feel physical pleasure, we know that things are most often right. The euphoric feelings of post-exercise or post-sex bliss communicate to our bodies that we are satisfied and safe. Turns out our emotions can work the same way. We just have to learn to read them before we react and then manage them before we make a mess of things, like we began outlining with our Recognize, Read, Respond checklist in Chapter 5. Joy and happiness and other positive feelings tell us that we're in a good place. Emotional hurt tells us we're not. As I was sorting through all of this, trying to locate language whereby I could understand and express my ideas in that book, I knew I wanted to speak with Dr. Benjamin Perkis. Dr. Perkis, I'll shorten it to DP, has 20 years of clinical psychological experience. That's his professional training. To be clear, whereas I can't diagnose people, that means he actually can. He has the training, the earned credentials, and the wisdom only time, and a lot of it, can bring. Professional plus practical plus personable. One day, DP told me, I loved my craft. I never envisioned myself leaving it, and I always thought I'd write a book about my practice someday. I just wasn't sure when and how. Turns out, he worked extremely close to home, on his front porch, in fact. A few years into practicing psychology, he and his wife closed in the porch, creating an office near the front door of his house where he saw clients. An innovator, DP ventured into groundbreaking techniques when he began practicing two decades ago. For example, EMDR, tapping, things like that. So when he was first introduced to essential oils in 2001, he was open to the possibilities. He and his wife became distributors with Young Living Essential Oils. Over time, as they had success using the products as part of their overall health and wellness routine and invited others to do the same, their essential oil business grew. DP says, I was living a dual life in the good way, doing two things I equally loved. From his office on the front porch, he was a practicing psychologist, a good one. From his kitchen table, he was an oiler. People visited his home for one or the other constantly, sometimes, many times, for both. Fast forward to 2015. Young Living held their annual international grand convention at the Gaylord in Dallas. I remember it well, as I spoke twice at this event. DP says he spoke with his upline one day and confessed he was torn between his two professions. He didn't want to give up either. He saw the power and efficacy of each and the need for both of them. In effect, each one actually enhanced the other, making him more effective on both platforms. As a platinum distributor with Young Living with a growing biz, how could he and his wife choose? His upline leader, Connie McDaniel, 
a royal crown diamond, the highest rank in Young Living, encouraged DP to create a tool. He decided the tool would be a book. Again, he always thought he would write one. He just assumed it would be related to psychology, not essential oils. By his own admission, I had no idea it would involve both, and then it would be an everyday language that anyone could understand, even if they didn't know psychology, and even if they didn't know much about the oils. At that point in his story, DP had been traveling at Young Living's invitation to teach about memories and trauma and other things he taught via psychology, and he'd begun using essential oils to empower people towards healing. It was all part of his presentation. In April 2016, almost nine months after that enlightening combo with Connie, he decided to jot a few notes for his eventual book while on a flight to Singapore. He returned and decided to churn out the book in time for the aroma sharing event, read Vendor Hall, at the next convention slated for mid-June. He had 60 days to go from potential to print to press. The book was completed, people wanted training to help others with this technique, and the entire movement known as AFT, shorthand for Aroma Freedom Technique, was launched quickly. I hadn't even thought about certifying people to use my methods at that point, but people who read the book during convention wanted training. They wanted to use my techniques, DP told me. After that, I knew I needed to figure it out, so we did, and the story continues unfolding. As we do with each monthly class for Oily App Plus, I wrote the Emotional Wholeness Checklist book, taught the class, and then created graphics and other content relevant to the overall theme of soul health and wholeness. Since emotional health was a significant part of my personal focus during that season for both personal and professional reasons, I landed there for my content creation for about two months. I wanted to dive deeper, though as this was a topic that and continued resonating with me for the past few years or so since that difficult 2016. Having been dealt traumatic blow after blow, many of them the results of my own actions, others the results of others' actions, I decided to pause and explore this area more. Turns out I have a job that offers me the freedom and flexibility to do so. Plus, like I mentioned in the intro, I tend to write about topics I need to address personally, not necessarily about issues I've mastered. I create content about my journey, not necessarily about my expertise. So, I hosted two podcast conversations with Dr. Perkis. I contemplated AFT certification, something I decided I'll do in the near future when the right time presents itself. I scheduled a Zoom call and put our Oily App audience in front of Dr. Perkis where they could hear how his technique works, ask him specific questions about his AFT, and then actually experience his technique firsthand. And after telling me the story of how AFT was born, DP explained how it works. Now, this isn't a book about AFT. You'll need to buy his book to learn that. But There are three powerful truths DP told me on those podcast interviews and during the Zoom call that have everything to do with claiming your freedom and walking in soul wholeness. And that is why I include this part of his story here. DP told me, there are three facts about human nature. Then he outlined a three. Number one, we're designed to explore and grow. Number two, exploration results in pain. Number three, we create rules to self-protect in an effort to avoid additional pain. Designed to explore plus more. First, we're designed to explore and grow, he said. This happens from the day we're born. Infants begin crawling, even poking into areas they shouldn't. Yeah, I replied. It seems like little tots are always trying to push forks into electrical sockets, jump into cabinets, and push the bounds of what's permissible. It's almost like you tell them not to do something, and then that's what they do, Perkis concluded. Then, it's because we're created to explore. What's the catch, I asked. Well, that leads us to the second point. We're designed to explore, but we're also created to learn from our experience, and then, now, get this, to avoid pain in the future by creating inner rules. What do you mean, I asked. Well, the inner rules are our ways of coping with the fact that some of our experiments hurt us. Some exploration is good, some exploration is bad. You lose some of your innocence as you venture into new territory, causing you to start playing it safe. 
When my kids were little, I told him, they all used to love it when I tossed them into the air. They would, every single one of them, run up to me, stretch out their arms, and ask for me to chunk them up and catch them. So I did. He laughed. Ever drop one of them? Never. But they all started getting nervous about being thrown high in the sky, as some of them called it, about the age of three or four. They used to beg me to do it. Then they, almost overnight, each grew terrified of it. I never understood why, because no one ever even came close to getting dropped. DP had some insight. By then, they had all learned to walk, though, and they had fallen. They had begun to ride bikes and probably taken a few spills. I realized the kids were responding to my tosses in the same way my veterans' friends were responding to fireworks and backfiring engines. The quick lift in the air triggered them to thinking they were about to fall, even though they were completely safe. They now responded to my present chunks in light of recent past falls, which I never saw. So they knew they should be afraid of heights, I concluded. Then, that makes sense. I was tossing them eight or nine feet in the air, so that helps me understand it now. Okay, Dr. Perkis said, now that you understand that, apply it to other areas of life. You learn not to cry because you do it one day and someone belittles your feelings. Or you get stage fright because someone makes fun of your singing voice. You learn not to trust people because a friend shuns you at the playground. Oh oh my, I replied. I've got a list that's a mile long of things I continue learning not to do even today. Well, Well, most people do. He said, the problem, though, is that we don't even think about those rules we create. They're often kept hidden from our conscious minds. They just become our default mode of operating, almost like we're on autopilot. I realized that these three rules created a belief-expectation relationship, but the relationship didn't remain static. Like a flywheel which continues gaining momentum with each new spin, every life experience which confirms our rules creates more of the same automatic behaviors. Before long, we find ourselves in a rut. It might be a good rut, or it might be a bad one. As I spoke with DP, I sketched the following graphic, putting together some of my thoughts in visual form. The belief expectation flywheel, as I labeled it, describes how our soul works. Now, in the book, there is just a picture of of a flywheel with four blades on it, just, just like a fan. Uh, The top blade is labeled, number one, experience. To the right, in the three o'clock position, number two, beliefs. At the bottom, number three, in the six o'clock position, is labeled expectation. And then on the left side, uh, which would be at the nine o'clock position, is labeled number four, behavior. So top, experience, then beliefs. Bottom, expectation, and the behavior. Experience, beliefs, expectation, behavior just continues going in a circle. Experience, beliefs, expectation, behavior. Let me read from the book as I explain how our soul works. Number one, we experience something. It might be a positive or a negative. Number two, we form some specific belief patterns based on what we experienced, especially as we begin to recognize repeating themes. Number three, We create expectations for the future based on our past experiences. The stronger and more negative these experiences are, the more likely they are to trigger a reaction, even an unwarranted one. Number four, we behave in the present based on the past, rarely realizing that our behaviors actually affect how we experience life. Of course, the loop continues indefinitely. Each new experience cementing our beliefs and expectations for the next run around the wheel. I thought back to combos with friends who lived with yellers and screamers in their homes while growing up, and to discussions with people who got frozen out when they revealed something about which they had a disagreement with someone, how they all created these rules in order to avoid future pain because they had all done a bit of exploration and found out that life, though it's good, is hard. The world isn't always safe. Getting triggered is the logical outflow of these protective rules. But getting triggered in relationships causes us to close ourselves off to the beauty of true intimacy. And getting triggered about other things can cause us to shirk back from potentially beautiful and life-giving experiences. I've got a confession, I said. Then I hit him with it, half-joking. I'm not an animal person. Used to be, back when I was little... But I just figured out now why I stopped being one. 
You created a rule about animals, it seems, he said. Yeah, I I loved dogs. I always had one. Then one day I went to my friend Daniel's house and had a run-in with one. His dog, Snoopy, was sleeping in the cockpit of an old fighter jet they had in the backyard. It was just the windshield. That was Snoopy's house. Was Snoopy a dog that looked like the actual Snoopy? No, he was a bigger dog, a big greyhound, a grey-blue color. He was normally pretty chill, but when I walked over to him, I was only seven or eight years old, I woke him up and startled him. He lunged at me and snapped. It legit scared me. I started crying, even though he never bit me. And you still don't like dogs today? It's not that I dislike them. It's just, well, I've kept my distance from them since that run-in with Snoopy. Yeah, I guess I have a hidden rule. Most people do the same thing in their unique ways, he said. We learn most of what we know by experience. We do this with hot stoves and heights. We make rules that say, don't touch hot things and don't go too far away from the ground like your kids did. I thought for a moment and then continued. I imagine we also learn to avoid certain things in relationships. We dump others before we get dumped. We hide our true selves. We guard our hearts. We stop being vulnerable. We withhold affection when we're afraid it won't be reciprocated. We, we stop trusting. As I talked, I sketched the three facts into my black moleskin journal. And in the book, you would see the graphic that you can find on the website soulholeness.com. Three facts about human nature. Number one, and it's just a man looking with binoculars. We're designed to develop and grow as we explore the world around us, and it says explore. Number two, there's a heart with a Band-Aid on it uh, labeled pain. Number two, pain, some exploration causes pain, which we want to avoid in the future. And then number three, there's a graphic with just three bullet points on a chart. It says three rules. We create rules, often subconsciously, to help us avoid future hurt. We do all of that, Dr. Perkis said. Here's what you need to see, though. The rules fall into two categories. They can be functional rules or they can be dysfunctional rules. He described them as you might imagine. Functional rules actually help us. They keep us from pain in healthy ways. Rules that keep us from touching hot stoves are helpful. Rules that keep us from walking down dark alleys at night, swimming in the ocean alone, or walking into oncoming traffic are healthy. Rules that caution us to take an Uber if we're going to drink at dinner serve us. You get the idea. Rules, even the ones we don't think about, can serve us. Dysfunctional rules hinder us. They keep us from progress in harmful ways. They're based on perceptions of reality and are often consistent with our past experience. Think back to the mortar fire and bullets. By the way, sometimes these rules have a basis in past reality. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they're consistent with past perceptions only. Now, in the book, there's another chart here. It says internal rules, friend or foe. There's three columns. The first column says type of rule. And then the second column says it is a. And then the third column says the result of that type of rule. And so here's what it says. The first line A functional rule is a friend and helps us. The result is functional rules keep us from pain in healthy ways. The second line, dysfunctional rule is a foe. It hinders us. Dysfunctional rules keep us from progress in harmful ways. So you see how those two relate. Here's what Dr. Perkis says, though. He says, our brains simply create the rules and follow them indiscriminately. Our brains don't discern whether the rules are functional or dysfunctional, whether they're friends or foes, whether they are keeping us from pain or progress, whether they are healthy or harmful. Now, as he said that, I thought about the bad emotions for a moment, or more accurately, how we label some as bad. They can help or hinder. They can keep us from pain or they can squelch our progress, just as we explained about fear in chapter four. All right, I said, You mentioned there were three facts about human nature. Your hidden agenda. Yes, Dr. Perkis continued. The first fact is that we're designed to explore and grow. The second is that we experience pain when we do. Third, our brains create rules to help us avoid pain. And, I interrupted, some of those rules make sense, some of them don't. Right, he continued. That leads us right into the bigger issue as it relates to trauma and healing. Here it is. We hide those rules from our conscious mind. What do you mean we hide them? I asked. I mean, you might not even know the rule is there. 
Or to say it another way, you might have a mental block to something and not even know the block exists. So I I might have an agenda and not even know what it is? Kinda. You might have an agenda that's hidden even to you, he said. As I pondered mindsets and thinking patterns and the perception isn't always reality tension, Perkis offered me an example. You've probably seen a dog with an invisible fence. Yeah, there's one right down the street from my house, I said. Whenever I run, he darts from the porch and makes a mad, rabid dash right at me. Used to freak me out because of my past experience with Snoopy. Until I figured out that dog would get shocked if he touched the sidewalk. He simply barks loud and toes the line all the way across his yard. I kind of taunt him now, to be honest. (laughs) You might need an AFT session for dogs only, he said. We laughed, then DP continued. When that dog was young, he was trained not to cross that barrier or he would be shocked. Today, the dog could actually get to you and bite. Uh, Oh my, I don't mean to burst your bubble, Dr. Perkis said, but he could. In time, the trainer removed that barrier that would have and certainly did jolt him, yet even now that dog remains in his yard. Then, after a short pause, he asked, why does he do it? I replied, because one day he went exploring. Fact number one. But he experienced a bit of pain. Fact number two. So he created a rule. Fact number three. Don't step off that grass lest he get electrocuted. I realized the flywheel was in full effect with that pup. Right. No more exploration and growth for the dog. He's not even aware the shocker is gone. He just obeys the rules without thinking about it as his default mode of living. We obey our own hidden rules as our default, regardless of whether they're functional or not. Like the elephant being held by a rope, I asked. Yes, or the person being held back from their dream, he continued. The person afraid of success, the person stuck in a negative pattern. Somewhere, if they think back through it, they have some hurt, so there was a basis for the creation of the rule. But now there's not, I asked. Maybe. Maybe not, but if something is holding anyone back from their destiny, it's certainly worth exploring. It sounds like these rules exist in our blind spots, I said, and that healthy relationships can help us sort through them. They do, DP replied. Empowering relationships are one of the most effective resources for people to move forward. The kind where people don't just cheer on the dysfunction. They tell you what you need to hear, not just what you want to hear. Soul memory muscle memory. At the time I was writing the manuscript for my book, Claim Your Freedom, the title in which this material originally appeared, I made a quick day trip to the Nashville area for a different project I had been working on for a few months. On the way back to Birmingham, I stopped in Huntsville to eat dinner with my parents. While splurging on Red Robin's bottomless fries, me, and the never-ending salad, my dad, some of these concepts started crystallizing in my mind. There's nothing like a few hours of windshield time alone to mentally process some things. Anyway, Dad offered me the regular and always sincere, what are you writing right now? I was midstream into writing this chapter, so I explained the previous few chapters and how they all led up to it. Did you see the NBA Finals? Dad asked. No, I've watched zero minutes of NBA basketball all season. Oh, well, Steph Curry is an example of what you're writing about. Except it's muscle memory, not emotional or mental or soul memory. He practices his three-pointers over and over until they're almost automatic. When he releases the ball, it's almost a given that it's going in the hoop. It doesn't matter how many defenders jump on him, how much they get in his face, how bad his balance is at that moment, or if he gets bumped. At some point, his muscle memory just kicks in, I replied. That's why he gets paid big. Yes, Dad continued, golfers too. A lot of the guys on the PGA circuit hit the same drives over and over. They repeat them ad nauseum, more than I've ever seen. But when the crowd is there and the stakes are high, they put the golf ball exactly where they want it to go. Muscle memory. It's a real thing. And so is emotional, mental, soul memory, I said. We live forward based on what's happened in the past, even if the present is nothing like the past. I wondered what would happen if a basketball player practiced his shot wrong for, let's say, a few thousand reps. Practice doesn't make perfect. Practice makes, well, more of what you practiced. Practicing the wrong thing creates the wrong muscle memory. Believing and even feeling the wrong thing creates the wrong soul memory. And because of that flywheel, the experience gets stronger 
and stronger and it continues turning. In other words, if you follow those hidden rules too often for too long a duration, you may need to release and then intentionally rewrite them. But that requires identifying the rules that are even there. Shooting a game-winning three-pointer is actually quite a feat when you face a handful of almost seven feet tall Herculean athletes charging you. The situation creates a heap of tension. But the championship game doesn't have to be on the line to experience such drama. Just about anything in life can do the job. For instance, many of us actually know what we want to do, what we desire in life. We crave a thriving marriage but need to face some tough combos in order to get there. We desire to grow a large, prosperous business, but need to put ourselves out there and lead others in order to do so. We imagine ourselves going back to school, but need to make some scheduling things happen before such is a possibility. You get the idea. There are probably a lot of important things you want, things just on the other side of an invisible fence that you're afraid might shock you. But, and this is the kicker, many of those hopes and dreams stand in contrast to what's safe. Those things are our version of the game-winning three-point shot made while falling backwards and jumping amidst galloping foot traffic while hearing people in the stands cheering for us and against us at the same time. While all of this occurs, our rules continue informing us, even if we're unaware of them, even if the boundaries are no longer in place. It may be that we have the wrong soul memory, right? Or perhaps we have the soul memory that saved us during a different season of life, one that we're no longer in. In fact, as you began envisioning what any of those victories or dreams might be for you, your mind might have begun flooding with negative thoughts almost immediately. Sometimes we go to war with our thoughts. Doing so often creates an internal tug of war, a true struggle. So we push our way through until we inevitably hit a wall and stop. The stop often reinforces a rule, an invisible one we hold in place. And a bunch of rules strung together often create a script a storyline we begin living, all as a means to manage our environment and protect ourselves from pain. In the next chapter, we'll talk more about this script as well as what we can do if we don't like the string of scenes in which we find ourselves. Okay, that's chapter 10 from Soul Wholeness. Again, all of the information that you need if you want to take a deeper dive towards the paperback, towards the audio files, towards the video course, all of that information is below. I would encourage you to take the free, quick, 10 question, yes, no. It will take you about two minutes. PTSD, self-check and just assess where you are, and then it'll give you some practical steps of where you might could go next. Again, this is Andy Jenkins. Thank you for riding with me through this time. Uh, I will be back in the next uh, week with information, as I said, on dealing with the roots and the fruits and the soul ties. And so so often, here's kind of the snapshot. We see fruit manifesting in our life, and we don't like it. But to deal with that fruit, you've got to deal with the root. All right? Let me pray for you as I leave. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May He be gracious and shine His face a favor upon you. Again, may you live fully present. And may you have the grace in the moment to recognize in the present when you are interpreting a safe present in light of hurts, wounds of an unsafe past. May you find the strength and ability to deal with that past, and may you become fully alive in the moment. Grace, peace, I'll see you soon.